This year might just be the right year to invest in property. But before you jump in, do you have a low-rate investment loan pre-approved? It might be the right time to invest, but the wrong loan could dent your prospects for achieving the maximum return. Are you armed with the best finance at the sharpest rate? Find out with Finney. Call us now on 1300 002 023 and find out what you could save. Or visit our website, finney.com.au to book an appointment. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. G'day, how are you going? Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I hope you're well. Chatting again through some finance scenarios. I know it's big on the agenda right now. Everyone, uh, I know a lot of people are stuck, actually, at the moment. Um, property investors can't borrow no more money. Serviceability constraints, uh, rising interest rates. Uh, stuff needs to happen, I think, to get people back into gear. Uh, borrowing, looking forward, that doesn't mean you can't be considering your mortgages right now because um, guess what? There's probably a more appropriate product out there for you if you want to do the hard work to refinance or, or even work with your bank to get a a sharper rate, more appropriate rate. Um, it's tough. Serviceability has changed. And, uh, you know, we're sort of nearing the top of the interest rate cycle, uh, whether a terminal rate yet, uh, probably not, maybe another one, two to come, uh, you know, 50 basis points, maybe 75 basis points all up, uh, and then we'll see the brakes being put on. Uh, the uh, Governor, Dr. Lowe um, of the Reserve Bank, has uh, been getting grilled recently by um, uh, in the Senate, uh, a lot of questions sort of around what's going on, the decisions being made by the RBA, uh, the impact on Australians. A lot of that question is coming out of certain areas of the political spectrum who have an agenda, uh, and this is in a political podcast, but... Um, Rightfully, all Australians are hurting right now, and and you know he can't control what's happening globally in terms of wars in Ukraine and and all these impact, all these factors were impacting inflation. He's trying to get inflation under control. That's what he's trying to do, and that's good to get that happening, get that reined in. We've got to put a lid on inflation and bring it back to normal levels, and that's normally two to three percent sort of band. That's where it's at. Um, the biggest issue he's got is that he pretty much told all Australians that rates wouldn't go up until um, 2024. So uh, a lot of people made decisions based on that. And, uh, you know, I get it. People are sort of a bit annoyed and having to tighten their belts, but that's the environment we're in right now. So property investment is a game of finance, absolutely. How you best manage your finances will absolutely determine your effectiveness uh, as a property investor. Where we are right now is that a lot of, even though people can afford principal interest loans. A lot of people are looking to bring them back to interest only to tighten it. But I remember back in a day where you didn't have to actually do an application to a whole new application to get a put back on interest only. You just used to call the bank and say, I want to go interest only. They go, you know, already sorted. Uh, so that's tough now. But the issue is that a lot of a lot of Australian borrowers now can't, according to service really requirements, service and interest only loan, even though they can afford principal interest. So this is a really strange world that we're in right now. And and you'll see over time, I think, softening of credit policy. Everyone's sitting around waiting for that. has got to be a signal that, that something's going on, that this sort of buffer, this 3% they're putting on top of rates, which means that a lot of people are getting like getting assessed at interest rates of like 9% at the moment. So that's the reason why they're struggling to not only refinance, but secure new debt. So the point is, get right across your finances, make sure what you've got right now is right, whether or not you are minimising your costs connected with it as much as possible and then think forward around it. And that needs to start with the mortgage broker, what you can borrow, when you can do it. The smart broker can certainly help you out and look at things a bit differently. And that's the benefit, one of the beauties of mortgage brokers, um, and one of the reasons why they write over 70% of all mortgages in Australia. So speak to your mortgage broker. I speak to my mortgage broker and I brought it back into the studio by popular demand, uh, Eva Lowings Ons. We get together every couple of weeks um, with view of just, Check it in, dialing in, keeping abreast of what's changing, whether or not she knows stuff that we don't know, and hopefully I can share it with you. But also more importantly is to share some of the scenarios she's working through. And we don't put any names to this stuff. We we make sure that these people are identifiable. We'll sort of mention to it, May. We might sort of chat about this, but we, we won't identify you because people 
want to know what other people are doing. It's easier for people to actually understand, appreciate other people's stories uh, and go, oh, that sort of sounds a bit like me. Maybe I can do something as well. And and the sort of scenarios we try and identify when we do these podcasts is stuff which is pretty common, pretty normal, looking at things differently, looking it through it a different lens, trying to achieve different outcomes. And a smart broker and brokers, uh, they connect with, with many, many different lenders and hundreds, if not thousands of different products. And this is the role of a mortgage broker to to consider your situation. And back in the day, they used to think everyone was a vanilla mortgage and and robots will do a people mortgage. I don't know any vanilla borrowers anymore. It's hard to get a home loan. Uh, so uh, you need someone fighting in your corner to help you out. So we've got a really good scenario today. Eva, how you going? I got your name right. It's embarrassing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The was third good. time we've done this now. It's good. Really popular. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Look, it's, uh, I think it's great. Um, we've had some clients actually getting in touch with us um, the last two weeks based on a scenario we shared and we've been able to help them. So mm. it's actually been good. Yeah, and I'm always quite interested in in what you're up to, um, uh, fitting mortgages. Uh, it's a mortgage broker I use. It's, it's a mortgage broker I leverage and you know, I believe in that business so much I invested in it. It's a good outfit. They're doing smart stuff, particularly for property investors. But my spies tell me, Eva, my spies tell me that you have been chatting with some buyers agents I know, Luke Maroney over at uh, Search Party. How's he getting on? Yeah, he's good. Yeah, yeah. We've um, we've been showing a little bit of um, um, why it's good to use a mortgage broker and why we should also use a buyers agents if you're trying to build a portfolio and build wealth over time. And I think that'd be a, some really good insights for people to either start their journey or keep on. The journey. Keep on doing. It. Is he busy yeah. at the moment? He's. I know he's pretty active. I've seen him out there. I know he does a lot of running. By the way, he's a huge runner, Luke. Um, yeah. uh, you, we follow him on the social media. I think he does a run every day. He's pretty committed to it. Um, but business well for him. He's doing well. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. 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 It's good. Yeah. Anyway, I, I've spoken to Luke for a while. I know he tunes into this and some of the other stuff too. So, g'day, Luke. Well, I'll drop you a note at some point. And say g'day, and uh, I keep up the good work. Uh, and and a lot of the commentary you're doing yourself around. Um, buying and investing in property, which is good. This sort of groundswell right now. There's a lot of interested parties trying to help out Aussies. And, you know, we're at a point in time right now, to my point, Eva, where it's challenging to get finance right now. It's 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 it's, it's stifling a lot of people's activities or they're having to think about things differently, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's been challenging for us as well uh, to find solutions. So it's definitely a time where some people are going to get stuck it's also a good time for people who are stuck to really get a second opinion, to check what they've been told and see if they can go again because it's going to probably get even harder in the next say, 6 to 12 months. So if you can get finance sorted now, refinance now, it's, uh, it's a good time to do it. Well, if interest rates going up, it just means people's serviceability is going to get yeah. even more squeezed. Okay. Now, I think we're sort of nearly towards the top of it and I think, Things will change, you know, there'll be a, a sort of subtle loosening of credit policy over time, but I don't think too soon after. Not It'll take a while once we hit the top of the interest rate cycle because the Reserve Bank's going to stop and go, okay, let's, we, we, need, we need this to take effect before we start, you know, trying to put a little bit more liquidity back in the system. So there will be some time, six months maybe, from the peak of the rates, maybe a year from the peak of the rates, and when you start seeing – the RBA sort of changing the way in which they want banks to be delivering credit. And you'll see those changes come through APRA, uh, the prudential regulator, which normally sort of tells the banks what to do in a simple way. They, they give the recommendations and guidelines around it. But to your point, so you guys over at Finney, um, you're happy someone going, hey, I've been told no by this broker. Can you know, have another look at stuff like that? Yeah. That's okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We've been doing a bit of that actually. And we've been actually finding that there is options. Maybe not exactly what the client had in mind, but um, it's just a time where we need to see and, and change strategy maybe to be able to keep going. So it's good um, to have a different view at a different way. Yeah. 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 See, okay. We need to think outside the box at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's science and it's art. And, uh, you know, you, you need your mortgage brokers to be able to think creatively. And the only way they can do that is being dialed in and attuned to what the lenders are doing, credit policy at any point in time. And by the way, credit policy can change. Like it's it's a really funny thing, mortgages, and you might not think it works this way, but I, let me give the inside scoop. Some lenders will go, we've got all this money and we want to increase the flow of new loans. So they'll go, okay, let's quickly do an offer. It might only be a week. They might go, for this week only, we will give this special rate or we'll give this particular incentive. There might be a cashback or whatever it is, right? But it might only be for 
a week they have it and they go, okay, we just want to get more money out the door for whatever reason it is. So they'll tell mortgage brokers going, hey, we've got this special deal right now. If So if you're not dialed into that or if your mortgage broker is not dialed into that, as a borrower, you're just going to miss it, right? So this is why you need your broker to be connected with what's going on. It's cool. It's it's, it's absolutely key. But um, so ask your broker. Just go, hey, I need it, need it now. What special deals are coming through? And you, you often find either the major banks do that stuff, but it's also, you know, some of the, I guess they call them mid-tier banks or or your non-major banks. It's different. And by non-major, you would talk about like maybe Bank West or Suncorp or AMP or whatever. It's a non-major bank. They're still big lenders. Like they often do special stuff, right? That only brokers know yeah, about. Yeah, there's tons of cashback offers at the moment, up to five thousand dollars just to move your loan to a different a different lender. Sometimes even when you purchase, yes, some really good rates just to get you in the door. There's lots going on. Um, and yes, if um, if your broker, if obviously your bank wouldn't know about all this, but if your broker is not uh, looking at all of that, you might miss out on, on yeah, big so, deals and also much better rates, yes. Yeah, and you don't always have to refinance the every rate as well. I, I called up um, one of my lenders just the other week, last week actually, uh, and I went, Hey, look, I've seen this rate. So again, banded around. I, I know someone who also banks for you got this. So I'll tell you who the lender is because they were super responsive. I'm sure they'd be happy for me to say that was St. George. And I went, Hey, look, can you sharpen this up a bit? You know, I, I want to stay with you, but you know, you got to be competitive, right? Like when I can get other rates elsewhere. And they were like, Okay, they had a look into it and they came back and they they shaved a few basis points off um, just because I'm a loyal customer. So, yeah, your banks will do that. You've got to go about it the right way. And I've, I've spoken about how to do that uh, in the past. But I want to talk about a scenario today, Eva, and um, we'll call a person Anita. Is that their real name, Anita, or did you make that one up? It's close enough. But it's not close enough. enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is her name Anita Loan? <laughs> I need it alone. Oh, God. Anyway, we'll talk about that. We'll just go to a break. Stay with us, everyone. Back in a moment. Are you looking to create passive income through property? Simon Liu from HouseFinder has achieved over $700,000 per annum in passive income by only buying genuinely off market, below market value, and cash flow positive houses within major capital cities. For the past seven years after quitting his day job, he has been helping others achieve similar goals to reach financial freedom. On average, his clients achieve $80,000 plus equity extractions from the houses they find, all within six months of buying. Visit housefinder.com.au to find out more. Uh, Welcome back, uh, everyone. Chatting with Eva from uh, Finney Mortgages, Lowenzance. I still struggle with it. It's embarrassing. Um, Anita's a nurse, 28 years old. Ninety five thousand bucks a year. They do overtime. There's a lot. Of, a lot of people do overtime, right? Which gets treated differently by lenders. Twenty grand overtime rents in Western Sydney for four hundred thirty bucks a week. And and Anita's is a nurse, right? So I remember back to the the last the, the the election before the one we have right now when um when 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 Labor was going to be a shoe in, right? And they reelected uh, Scott Morrison. I think um, Shorten was was the opposition leader, and he was preparing for um forming government. He didn't get in. But they went into it trying to, you know, sort of painting a picture around property investors and it was talk about changing the way in which um, the taxation will work for property investors, which was going to be negative for property investors. So there was this sort of big big fanfare around it, Eva, and this is a point I'm making, so bear with me. But it was sort of like, you know, they tried to um, – there was this sort of sense of demon, demonization of property investors, and it's probably the wrong term, but it was like – Property investors are rich people. Property investors are hugely wealthy and, you know, whatever. But, you know, the reality of property investing is that the everyday Australians, I think 8% of Australians in some way claim some some of the tax deduction on their tax return as a property investor. And the point was that their nurses, their teachers, their police people, they're people with like the, these, I would say, hugely important jobs in the economy, but they're not deemed to be these high paying jobs. They're just normal Everyday Australians getting on with stuff with these jobs, firemen, you know, um, ambulance drivers, you, you know, people working in factories and stuff like normal Australians and property investors. So I'm happy that you've brought this up as a uh, an example because a nurse on 95 grand with 20k overtime, right? Like that's not a bad salary. Let's be clear, right? It's, it, but it's not it's not the upper echelons of what people are earning. It's it's pretty standard, Eva. Yeah, look, she um, yeah, she earns that say. Um, Probably not the average, but a little bit over that. But nothing, yeah. She's not like a, a CEO with huge bonus and dividends and, and what have you. So, and yeah, most of people we see through Fini anyway are yeah everyday Australians, definitely. It's just getting on with stuff. I I know 
there's cops. I know there's a number of police people that you do uh, yeah. uh, doing loans for, and uh, and by the way, that can be the hardest. I know a lot of cops. That can be really hard to deal with. Uh, <laughs> Particularly, particularly detectives ask too Let's many questions. Let's not start on that. <laughs> <laughs> they ask too many questions. <laughs> very, very curious, inquisitive people. Um, uh, thanks to all of our, uh, our boys and girls uh, in blue who uh, look after stuff um, in the important work that you're doing. So, uh, Anita, nurse, you know, there's people on the front line of the COVID pandemic every single day still, you know, supporting Aussies. Um, she bought her first investment property in February 2022. Uh, for 435k, Eva in Western Australia, she had cash money for a 20% deposit, which is good. Working hard, doing overtime, saving her shekels. So she wanted to buy a second property with her buyer's agent now, but she's got no more cash, and she doesn't want to pay LMI. So she wants to buy a property, but she's got no money, and she doesn't want to pay LMI. So she's stuck. Tell me about this scenario. Yeah, so she's got actually a little bit of a uh, little bit of cash behind her, but she wants to keep it for you know personal use. So she was really at the time when she bought her first property a year ago, she was really set on to buying two properties and thought that she could be um keep on saving and, and keep investing and then by now she would be ready for the second one. Turns out obviously with rate going up and she's been going a bit overseas and, and traveled a bit. So the cash savings that she thought she'd have isn't wasn't there. Uh, so she has she has some cash, but it's just not enough to buy a property. Or maybe she could, but only with a 10% deposit at this stage. And that obviously incur lenders mortgage insurance, which is not a bad thing in itself, but she, for some reason, is very set against it. She's like, I'm not paying any extra fees. I refuse to do it. Uh, she wouldn't be able to see the bigger picture of, you know, $10,000 worth of LMI is nothing when your property is going to, you know, grow by, you know, 100 k She just, she knows this, but she just can't get to a, a head around it. So she's like, I'm not paying LMI, find another way. So that's where she's at when she comes and see me. Yeah. So you can't persuade her. Down this no. path of LMI. And just for, I know a lot of investors are going to go, yeah, we know what LMI is, don't need to go back over it. But we get a, a big spread of of, of um, investors and potential investors tuning into this podcast. LMI is lenders mortgage insurance. So it's an insurance policy you pay for that protects the lender that you default on the loan. So mm-hmm. it's not nothing to do with protecting your property or whether it's because you're going in at a, 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 a with a less deposit, so not at 80%, 90% LBR, which means you're putting 10% down and the bank's poning up the rest of the money. This ensures the lender um, around uh, in, in the ensuring the integrity of the repayments over time. So that's what the policy is. Back in the day, I used to do a bit of stuff with with Gemworth. Uh, Gemworth is like one of the, the large, or it's probably sort of the largest uh, LMI outfit in Australia. And, and I remember like they used to bang on about it all the time, right? For this exactly this reason. Even where people go, I don't want to pay that. I don't want to pay that. And 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 their logic would be, we can pay the LMI now. And and I don't know what LMI is on a, a four hundred thousand dollar loan. It's probably about. I'm so far away from it now. Was let's it about, say, oh, let's say uh, between eight and ten thousand, depending on the bank. Yeah. Well, between eight and ten grand. And so they would say, you pay that money now, which can be capitalized into the loan, right? So you don't actually need to go and find this money. It just means your your mortgage is a bit higher. It's an enabler, so it allows you to get into the market earlier. And if you look at the long-term history of property in Australia, it goes up in value. So they're saying, if you wait to save another 10% on your your mortgage, 10% to to afford the property and and get a mortgage without LMI, the property might have gone up by $50,000 or $60,000. So you're missing out of it. So why can't Anita see that? Like, I don't know, maybe she should listen to this podcast and go, I sort of understand it now. But um, we went straight for quite a while and she does understand it. She just said, I just, my mindset is like, I do not want to pay anything extra to bank. And she just refuses to see it. So there was just no way for her to get to that. But, um, you know, the things about, I would argue going, well, you don't need to use a buyer's agent. You do it yourself and you can save yourself 10 grand there, like really, or whatever it is. I don't know which buyer's agent she's using, but but she's going, no, I want to use a buyer's agent now. So yeah, she sees yeah. the value in a buyer's agent as enabler to get a better yeah. property yeah. at the purchasing side, but she can't get beyond the fact that she doesn't want to pay, which is okay, by the way. I'm not, I'm not giving her a hard time. Yeah, yeah, no, she just doesn't see value in it and just, um, yeah, just absolutely refuses to do it. So we obviously had to dig, dig a little bit deeper into her situation and find and find a way around it for her to 
to go again now because she's like, oh, I'm just going to go and save and come back next year when I've got enough money. Whereas, obviously, her buyer's agent, I think, is right in, in the way he says to her that it's a really good time to buy now because the market seems to be, you know, in, in the cycle that is at the bottom or bottom-ish. So it's a good time. That's what she knows or, or what she understands, but she didn't want to pay LMI. So. Okay, so she doesn't want to pay LMI, so she, but she doesn't have a 20% deposit. So yeah. th- there must be some solution yeah. around it. So I'm going to ask you about that. We'll just go to a break. Eva, before we do that, tap back in a moment. Would you like the latest news and insights in HR, leadership and people management? HR Leader has you covered. Subscribe at hrleader.com.au. Welcome back, Phil Tarrant. I'm the host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm with Eva Lorenzance from Finney Mortgages chatting through this scenario. I, I don't get it. Like, you know, this LMI thing, I've, I've paid LMI uh, beforehand because I just went, I actually wanted to conserve the cash, right? Yeah. And in many ways also, if you if you you could sit there and do the math, if if you, you know, use LMI, capitalise it into your mortgage, save the 10% and offset the mortgage against it, you're probably ahead of the game if you do the math properly, but that's a different thing altogether. So no LMI, once you use a, a buyer's agent, once again, a new property. What was the solution or, or, or was there a solution? Was there a solution? Yeah, yeah, so we did find a solution. So we just sat down and really went through the whole, you know, the whole um, scenario. So first, when she said to me, okay, I bought this property for 435000 it was it was a year ago. So I asked her, do you know now what is the value of that property? Because it could have gone up or, you know. And she's like, no, I actually didn't have my property Revalued in the last uh, 12 months, so I didn't really actually know what it was worth. So the thing here that to consider is property price can go up and down very quickly, and you might have bought a property for 435, uh, and she bought it through a buyer's agent, so it could have been worth more already at the time she bought it, um, but she didn't, you know, didn't check, didn't know. And two, it's been a year, so things could have moved quite a bit already. So the first thing was to actually organise evaluation of, of a property and see if it actually was any equity there that we could use to buy a second property. So that wasn't actually um, an idea that was um, brought up to her at the time by her lender. And so she, she just did not. So that's the first thing. The other thing is when you do evaluation with, um, with a bank or with a mortgage broker and it's not good enough or it's not high enough for what you need, maybe try to do evaluation with another bank on another lender because we do often see 10 to 15 percent variance between banks and value so it can just mean uh, 10 percent on 500k property it's enough to go again so uh, make sure you revalue your property and make sure that if it's not good enough you ask for a second second go at it somewhere else and you need to control that process as well as what I found over years. Uh, because when you do a valuation, you pretty much say what you think the thing's worth, right? You don't leave that out there in the open. You you want to try and control that process to make sure that your mortgage broker is putting the right information on documentation. And even if you've got a good reason or case for why, you might have done a renovation or something like that. Like you, it's really good if you can evidence this stuff so the valuer knows what's happened from purchase price to where it is right now. And, and that can take some time. You know, if you do a reno over a month, they're not going to completely revalue it up straight away. But if you've got a bit of breathing space, a year or so even, like as a yeah. different property, you might have added a bedroom, done something smart, changed all around. You can really, that's called manufacturing equity, right? Smart operators do that now, able to present in the way in which the value understands and appreciates it, you know, and, and value is are pretty much in and out really quick. And, and you, you know, some of your valuations might just be an automated, what do they call AVM, is it? An automatic yeah, yeah. valuation yeah, yeah, model or right. something or other. And sometimes they'll come back and you go, no, nah, they got that wrong. Send out send that's out right. someone to the property, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, in her in her case, she actually did buy a property that was a bit run down at the time and she did very minimal cosmetic changes, like a bit of paint, a uh, new carpet and the kitchen. Actually, she just repainted the, the cupboards and it, it just looks so much better, right, uh, based on the photos I've seen anyway. And then so a value went in and the property valuation came back at 478 from 435 when she bought it. So there's quite a bit there that we, we can play with. So she, she was surprised, obviously, and um, and happy. So that was the first thing we, we looked at is the valuation. Is there any equity there, which there is. So that was um, 
yeah, that was one point to, to really um, share with listeners today because that's often missed is how much is worth. So the idea is that get the current investment property revalued. If there's equity in there, you can refinance that and use that that additional cash as a deposit to add to cash deposits you've got to come up with the 20%. Yeah. That, that's right. like, you know, it's really funny and it's not really funny, but um, uh, for a lot of people, when they understand that, it's like you see it all the time. It's this light bulb moment. People don't get it. And you see, I've seen it time and time again with property investors over the years where they go, "What? Well, so I can buy another, they go, so I can buy another investment property by using the, because I bought well, the growth I've had in that property to refinance it. And that means that as a deposit, I don't need to save myself. I can, and, and you, you see people doing that, their mind, you see their, their, they go, really? Is that, is that, can you, can you do that? And when they, when they understand it, they, it blows their mind and they become <laughs> obsessed with property. Like you said, they become obsessed with property investment. And that's good if you're buying good properties, right? You know, let's remember most Australian investors have one or two properties. And the reason why is because, the first property they buy is not a good property and it doesn't allow them to do that. So this comes back to like your first property and property investment is absolutely key because that will be the accelerant to supporting you to do stuff. And, you know, depending when you get started in property will will shape your strategy around doing it. But the idea of, you know, time in the market rather than timing in the market, as in the longer you're in, in the market and property investment, the better off you're probably going to be about it, right? So you buy well to start you can then during this, they call it the accumulation phase. This is where you're you're building your portfolio. You know, you want to make sure it costs you as little as possible to hold or even be positively geared, but that's very hard in this market to just kick in off. At a point in time, your properties, if you hold on them, you don't increase the debt, should become neutrally or positively geared, but it's a different chap. But it's about getting the right one early and understanding that the asset is not the fact that it's growing in value. And that's long-term asset stuff, right? Because you can realize that. The real asset for you is the the growth in the equity means you can pull that out to buy more stuff. And this sounds like Anita. So did she get it when you explained that to her? Yeah, you know? so that was the first thing. And she has borrowing capacity to to borrow that equity. So that was that was already a, a good win, but still a bit short there. So we had to look at you know other avenues. So the other thing we we looked at with Anita is that traditionally, and I'm sure some of um, some people have used that, is there is an AMI waiver traditionally given to accountants, lawyers, medical professionals, uh, some sport professionals, you know, the, the people that generally have a high income. However, recently, uh, there is a bank that added that for nurses. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, it's only recent. So obviously that fits Anita perfectly and her uh, dream of not paying an MI just came true just because she's a nurse. So... <laughs> Really they, is there anything for, for podcasters? <laughs> yeah, my way. I'll check, I'll oh. check for you. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon the bank's going, no way, not for them. They're, they're, they're it's fickle, those people. But um, but it's a really good point. And, and if you don't know, depending on your profession, right, because they go, like, I don't know if they do it for cops or for emergency service people, but they go, or teachers, you know, because they go, that job is so in demand and the continuity of that employment is largely guaranteed, right? Like you got to do something wrong in order not to be able to turn a buck doing these type of jobs. So they go, all right, well, all professionals, right, like accountants and lawyers and stuff, they go, they're okay. They're right. They make lots of money. So there's specialised professions. That's really cool. Are you going to disclose which lender or people are going to call you up to try and work out all the nurses yeah. across the land are going? Goodness. Goodness. <laughs> Goodness. But, yeah, um, nurses is now an LMI waiver option. So Anita, in this scenario, so on a property that increased in value to 478 and having no LMI up to 90%, she could get $82,000 worth of equity out of her property. That's enough to buy her second property. So did she refinance the original one at 90 rather than 80%? Yeah, at 90% because there's no LMI payable, so she was happy to, to go cool. again. Yeah, to go again with that. And she can also buy her second property at 90% with no LMI. With the same lender? With the same lender. And on the basis that she meets the serviceability requirements. So that's a different thing, right? Like does her actual income and her lifestyle and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, this when it gets down to the intricacies of, yeah, there might be an LMI waiver for nurses, uh, means that she can finance two investment properties at 90%, which is great. 
but you've got to be able to service the debt and meet those thresholds um, at those higher rates that we spoke about. So this is when the little nitty gritty stuff that you do in every day and not thinking about it, like buying lunch every day, getting an Uber Eats, you know, four or five times a week, taking Ubers everywhere, like everything use the tapping on your on your credit card, right? Like the data matching now is huge and banks just put your statements through a machine and just go, you know, what this person's telling me in that, what do they call it, the HEM? Yeah, thing yeah. is very different to the realities, right? And and most people go, oh, that's all right. Give me the loan. I'll stop doing those things, right? I'll stop ordering your reason. I'll stop going to concerts every weekend and I'll stop doing all these sort of this discretionary spending. Once you give them the loan, I promise I'll stop doing that. And lenders go, no okay. way, you, you know, no way. So if you're going to go on this path, you've got to start changing your spending habits today because, you know, you want to show, I would say, probably six months either of, of living to a different yeah, yeah. way. Three months. Three months at the moment that's what we, we need to look at because you can have a month you know that's really good a month that's a bit higher some stuff you have to, to spend are uh, only uh, per quarter so we need an average within three months so if you do have high expenses and you do want a mortgage it would be good to start being a bit careful three months in advance yeah. and where do the lenders like to see you cut back is just that discretionary stuff right they've got to expect you to eat food and stuff yeah. and and some clothes like you know if, if you see you know, designer shopping every weekend, right? That makes them a bit nervous if you're at serviceability thresholds, right? But we find that it's actually in the food and groceries that we see people actually being very good or being a bit carefree and then the difference can be thousands sometimes per month for the same, you know, family, let's say two adults, two kids. So that's I think that's where people need to be careful also. How did you find the lender to deal with on this? Were they, I know they... I'm just being general here, and we spoke about it earlier. They'll come up with this, like some sort of marketing thing, saying, "Oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, whatever else, right?" And then when you sort of you know, look under the hood or scratch a bit further, they go, you're going, "These guys are never going to give loans. It's just a bit of hot air, right?" Like this lender you're talking about with this LMY thing for nurses, like it was a genuine thing. They're going, "We will." Yeah. This yeah. is yeah, yeah. That's um, that's an ongoing offer as well. It's not like um, you know, a week thing or, or a month thing. It's been added to the list of professionals that are eligible for LMI waiver. So it's ongoing. And that's come from, uh, you know, as brokers um, making sure we are up to date, going to webinars with the lenders, listening to what they're telling us is new for for the months, reading the newsletters. So it's a lot there for us to also keep updated on, but that was part of one that really helped Anita to get to where she wanted to be. So it was, was mm-hmm. great. It was a great um, right outcome for her. So she she got the so she refinanced the loan, pulled the money out, got a deposit together. She's bought the new place, or she's in the process of doing it now. Yeah, no, she. So at the time we had a pre-approval, and she ended up buying a property for five hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Okay, in Brisbane, sounds. I don't know. I'm guessing, maybe. Can you tell me? Not secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, that's you know, again, it's pretty sort of standard. Like I would say, it's a very normal scenario that we just run through there. Mm. That's cool. I, I, I didn't realise. Um, do they give mortgage brokers any preferential? No, stuff? no. <laughs> <laughs> Big shame, but no. I'm going to lay down a challenge to all the for podcast people. I reckon that's that's the gold. I'd be happy to bring you on and have a chat about it if you do that. It'd be a nice thing. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you got next for us? Have you got another scenario? I know we get together every couple of weeks now to do this. Have yeah. you sort of you got anything any bubbling away? Yeah, I was thinking of maybe mentioning a little bit more about SMSF. I know some um, sophisticated investors might want to look at refinancing the SMSF. That's on generally very high rates. Uh, so that could be, uh, could be an option. We've got new lending options now allowing for 90% NVR on SMSF. 90% on SMSF uh, for yeah. RESI, right, not for commercial? RESI, yeah. yeah, yeah. RESI. Uh, you know, so like, and I can't remember who told me, but it's some time ago, this is before the interest rate cycle, I went up and they went, you know, you can get SMSF loans at like this much. And I think I might have referred someone over to you guys pretty much. And I went, what are you paying on your SMSF? And it was like, I'm paying, yeah, as before the rate rise. It's like, it was really high. And I went, you know, you know they're, they're doing rates now like a lot cheaper. Like there was this sort of period of time when SMSS were the flavour of the month, then they made it really expensive. There was only a handful of lenders. Like a lot of lenders pulled out of SMSF lending. But then sort of then it started sort of coming back in. There was a lot more interest from lenders in SMSFs. Um, so that's sort of 
trend has continued. Like there's more options available now. For yeah, people. there's actually a lot of competition around SMSF because it's actually a lot easier to service for those. So uh, sometimes it's the only loan that people can refinance and save on when you know they're stuck in outside of SMSF, and that's also the only place they can buy a property. So it's it's becoming more and more common uh, for investors to have three, four properties. They're stuck, they can't do more, and then they're looking at doing okay. it through SMSF. That, yeah, let's. I think that'd be a really good case study because. If people have got a big and 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 the retail and industry funds will hate me for saying this, but if if you've got a big balance in your 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 retail or industry funds, um, and you're just getting a return, and say you've been building it up for twenty years, you're, you're a doctor or a lawyer, or you know a lot of them have super funds, but um, like nurses and cops and these people we're talking about, you might want to have a think about you know how you can deploy that inside of an SMSF because. With SMSF lending, they don't consider all the other stuff. It's it's insulated to just the SMSF, right? So if you have a big deposit based on the balance of your your super fund, you've got to remember it's a lot more restrictive investing inside of your SMSF. Like you can't like manufacture equity, you can't do all that sort of stuff. It's very hard. You can't offset, I don't think, mortgages inside of it. So it's a it's a lot more restrictive what you can do. But if you want to keep investing in property, you can actually deploy that those super funds into it. Um this is the reason why the, the industry and, and retail funds hate people taking out their uh, uh, yeah. their, their, their balances and setting up as some assets and they're, they're trying to get rules and stuff changed around it because yeah, do you know now, Eva, that assets inside of SMSF uh, and the super side of SMSF is larger than than industry and retail funds combined, right? It's a lot of assets inside of super funds now. Um, so let's do that. Okay. Super fun lending. What, yeah. Can you give us any insight on, maybe I'll, I won't put you on the spot, but I'd like to just run through some rates, what sort of rates people can get inside of super. Um, yeah, uh, because- I think on it's around the six, five to 6%, again, depending on LGR, depending what type of property. And they do have offset now as well within SMSF. Some oh, banks, really? Some banks. Yeah, so that can make a big difference. Um, really? Who? Yeah, yeah uh, first, first Mac, for example. Okay. So there is uh, there is option. It used to be as well that you needed 200k to start with an SMSF. That's not the case anymore. So um, yeah. it, it's becoming more and more flexible. And as I've seen it, like it used to be a lot of, as you said, doctors, lawyers, solicitors that would come to me with SMSF. But now it's it's everybody. It's um, nurses and cops, as you said. It's it's every every day Australian that 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 thing. That's that's the way to go. To, to put a uh-huh. copy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's cool. All right. I look forward to that. That um yeah. and, and by the way, we're not providing any advice whatsoever. It's just a couple of people having a chat around mortgages. So I don't want to be sort of a bit of a wet blanket on on waivers and stuff. But um, you know, the, the idea of these chats is just to to chat through some scenarios so you can start thinking in a particular way, going, Oh, that sounds like me, or that sounds like this person, or or whatever. You've got to come up with a better name than Anita Loan, no. <laughs> I was quite happy with that, by the way. But it's just that it says, yeah. So, so um, if you talk about SMSFs in particular, get some advice. Go and see to your accountant, and they'll give you all the the pros and cons about investing inside of a super fund. Right? Um, the costs connected and associated with it. A lot of onerous compliance around it. You got to get audits. You know, it's not all it's not all bells and whistles. It it, it requires. And if you're not a very sort of thorough person and stuff like, you know, you've got to get your administration right. There's pros and cons with it, uh, like all things in investing in property. So um, make sure you lean on your accountant or whoever you use for that sort of stuff to get the right advice. But if you keep up the good work, sounds like you're, you're helping people continue their march down, creating wealth uh, uh, through uh, property investment, despite you know, some of the challenges of rising rates. Uh, there's always good to get a second opinion. So you go and chat with these guys. If you want to have a yarn there, even if you just want to stress test something, what's what's the best way? Just at your website, Eva? Yeah, go uh, on finney.com.au, put your details there. We will call you very shortly after that to, to book you in. Yeah. All right. There you go. You got it. And you can chat to Eva and, and she's a senior broker there. She's got a, a really talented team as well. So uh, I'm sure they'll put you with the right person to uh, get you down that pathway. I uh, hope you enjoyed that, everyone. I do enjoy it. It's, it's a bit sad, actually. I do really enjoy talking about mortgages. And the reason why is that, by the way, I hate mortgages. I wish I didn't have them. Back to the French, it's called death pledge. You know, most property investors have a love-hate relationship with mortgages. That's a huge enabler for creating wealth. It's how best you package, sustain, and minister 
think about your finances, the better property investor you. That's why I get excited about mortgages, about what it can actually do. So we'll do more of this. Uh, check in smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, social media, if that's where you like to get your info, Smart Property HQ is where you'll find us. And that's cool. We'll be back talking about mortgages soon. Uh, until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.